things do require context. Like we're only where we're at mm -hmm. because we weren't there. We yeah, weren't we there. weren't always there. Right. And they say it's like a pendulum swing moment because mm -hmm. like it's so awesome that we're overcorrecting. I just hope that we don't go too far backwards because there's you always swing until you, you meet a stasis in the middle. generation under me that like would feel that I'm pretty body pause but like pretty body pause do you know what I mean I'm not sure <laughs> like, I'm like, body pause I'm not sure I'm that I love in a bralette bra. that's fun but like for my boyfriend or sleeping or taking yeah. the dog out to pee but like that's Valid. about as far as I'll I'm like bold taking the dog out to pee are you yeah I'll, I'll like run out in like a thong and be like go piss oh really yeah because I'm like <laughs> I'm like whatever if somebody sees me that's their fucking problem that's their, no that's their win for the day that's actually so true hold on I can't see you I want to see you a little bit see me chat. well just like more I think I'm like the nudist like neighbor like you know how everyone has one or you are the nudist neighbor Shh. I think it's just me let me just make sure well, just because I'm... Didn't look really, at us. Just look I at us. I saw another clip of this where you were talking to Neil deGrasse Tyson. Oh, yeah? Table, so I'm like, no. I know. That was, in New, that was in New York. So, like, they there's a slightly oh, diff, slight diff set up. It's knees. Would you like a coffee table? We can always put this You're coffee hilarious. table. hilarious. No, I think it's... I mean, I just have to, like, remember to be a lady. It's hard, dude. Well, if I cross my legs, you're going to get... I know. Full thong. Full thong. Full thong. And we love that. <laughs> <laughs> As long as you're comfortable with it, we love it. And if not, we fucking hate it. I'm super comfy. Okay, good. This is so cute. This is it great. Is cute, right? Really good. Yeah. Really cool, guys. Thank you. I didn't design it, but I do respect it. No, it's a good setup, and it looks like your house or something. Like a yeah, it looks like, profesh. But also like your like living room profesh. Yeah. You know what like I mean? Like a profesh living room. Like I'm very stylish. Well, it's like that's sort of the podcasty vibe. Vibe. Yeah. I think it is. It literally is. All right. I'm going to try not to like gulp on cam. I think so. Is I'm just trying to. In your way. Well, I'm just trying to find a way to see her. But I think if I we, sit. We can, we can turn this. Yeah, we can chill. Yeah, just, just get up for a second. I don't want to cut off the coverage either. Don't worry about it. I Are think you I, sure? Yeah, I think this is okay. If I think oh, if I sit like this and. Okay, okay. We chit chat. And, All, right, cool. All right, good, good, good. Yeah. Make sure. Thank you, though. I appreciate it. The birth of the modern world society. Yeah, I've actually never looked at what. what, or <laughs> what <birds are> <laughs> <laughs> They're, They're just sure blue. They just. Oh, Dave Barry turns 40. That's actually really funny. Oh, yeah. Is it? The Tale of Glenn? I'm like, have I read any of these Gen? Don Quixote? I think I read that in high school. Genji? Oh, my God. I'm like, dyslexia is so bad. I just had to read that like four times, and each time it was like a different book to me. You know what? A cousin of mine, obviously, dyslexia is not like a new concept to me, but my cousin's daughter is dyslexic, but is recently diagnosed as in like, I would say the last three years. She's yeah. 16 now. And her whole grades, like everything, once they figured out that she was like, you know, cause she would work really hard, mm -hmm. really good kid, like tried, tried, tried. And like, didn't, which I'm sure is a story work. with a lot yeah, of dyslexic it kids. Sucks, dude. And then she was like, letters like turn upside down on me, like all this. And I was like, I'm so fascinated by those computer programs where they like yeah, where show you yeah. what it's like. Like I'm like, that must be maddening. I know. I you know what's crazy about those programs is I I always wonder what it's actually like for other people to see it because it just looks the same. It looks to like, me. That's crazy. so. I'm just like, yeah. I mean, I'm assuming this is working because you guys are reacting to it. But. but when you were like learning to read, did it like? I mean, you didn't know what you were looking at was different from anybody else was looking. Yeah, because you were little. Yeah, but like. I don't even know what the question is I'm asking. Like, was it, it must have been hard to concentrate on the words on the page. But did it, like, I guess in a, like, a not delicate way, did it drive you crazy? That, yeah, like, it drives me fucking crazy now. Now, yeah, no. And as I, a kid, it's just, yeah, now you're like, you know. Hell? Yeah, now but, I know. I got diagnosed really early because mine's so bad. Okay. They were like, oh, shit. But, uh, yeah, like, I used to write paragraphs like this and then inverted and then, the right way and I couldn't tell the difference so my teachers were like 
something that's fucking wrong with our brand. What Whoa. The hell? But yeah. that's, but now think about it. Like actually. It's kind of cool. Your brain is amazing. Yeah, I'm like, sorry, you guys can't read in every direction. <laughs> read in every direction. It's kind of lame, actually. I had to learn cursive first. It's easier for dyslexic people. Is it really? Yeah, it is. Because like the, the problem with dyslexia is like a B and a D and a nine and a six. They're all the same fucking thing from different directions. But sure. cursive, they're all different. So it makes it a lot easier because if it's moving around, you can still identify what letter it is. Oh, my God. You just lit. I'm the blown mind emoji right yeah. now. Like you just blew my mind. There's That's- a lot of things that people don't like think about in those terms. Like you didn't know if we talk about dyslexia on this. and TI and stuff right. from completely different angles. Same word. Same really confusing. word. Yeah. It's terrible. Anyway, welcome to Days at Night. Thanks. Are we rec- is this going? Yeah, going? we just started. We're going. We're going and dyslexia is the topic of the day. <laughs> yeah, we were just <laughs> starting on dyslexia <laughs> casually as we do. But can you give us a little bit of an intro as to who you are for our new reviewers? Sure. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, my name is Deirdre Friel. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm an actress and uh, a, I'm not, oh, I shouldn't say I'm a writer, but I've sort of write now. And um you invited me to talk about some projects that I've been working mm-hmm. on, and I'm really excited to be here. Uh, this is so corny. Make it better when you do this. Dude, thing. you can be, you can be, ex- <laughs> you're not corny. You can be excited. I she know. had a harrowing experience getting here. She, it was wacky. I'm, I'm on a, a quest. Little shook. I'm not myself right now. Tell them about your quest. No, it was just a bad <laughs> Lyft driver. If you have Janet, just don't get in her Lyft. <laughs> Zero stars for Janet. It was a little, Janet was having a day. It was like Janet was my grandma and thought I was like, Riding in her back seat yeah. and should be respecting her car. And I'm mm-hmm. like, I'm, you know. And then yes, threw a charger at your head. Not at my head, but <laughs> but in the general direction of the Towards back you, seat. Though. And I literally was like, and then I'm like, okay, 14 minutes to go texting like, my boyfriend. It's going to be a long 14 <laughs> it's be minutes. A long 16 minutes. It's been brutal so far. <laughs> yeah, that's tough, dude. For, for, <laughs> to transition from that like you've done a lot of really cool projects you know like (laughs) soft just a soft transition just like a soft super hard transition you have done a lot of cool projects though that like I was reading your IMDB and I was like getting excited and stuff because like first of all so you did an ep with the Sopranos that's fucking awesome so that was my very first thing I ever did on camera that's crazy it was crazy because I hadn't even done like a student film or like I'd know. You just went right in. And I only had gone to like theater school. So I think we had like an on-camera class like for a semester, but it wasn't even. Yeah, it was like barely anything. Yeah, I didn't even know what a mark was on the floor. Like so when I got on The Sopranos, Mm -hmm. they were like, she's not stepping on her mark. And then I had to figure out, oh, they put the tape on the floor. They're like, oh, that's it right there. It was very much learning on my feet. Um, but the great thing about, I mean, obviously, aside from it being super iconic mm-hmm. and me being, I'm Irish and Italian from Jersey. So it's perfect for you. It was dead on. Um, they were like all of those guys on that show mm-hmm. before that show happened. They were like the Italian guy in whatever movie. Right? Mm-hmm. Sorry. Yeah, they're typecast. So then when they all came together, like the environment was extremely friendly and warm because- Big they, Italian family. Yeah. And they really valued like authenticity, I think, over like major on-camera experience for mm-hmm. like some of the smaller roles. I was actually up for a pretty big role on the series. Um, and I think I ended up ev- essentially not getting it because I had no- Experience. So they were just like nervous. They're like, it would be a big risk. A hundred. I get, I mean, I get it. It would have been, I I, like, I don't even know. I was so young. I was like, I don't even know, maybe 19 or I was a young that I was like, you don't know at that time if you can deliver, you know, when they're like in cry now or like whatever. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I I had gone through this like really rigorous audition process for that role. And uh, Chris Walken's wife at the time, I think, or maybe they were divorced. Georgie Ann Walken was one of the, casting directors for it and she felt so bad about what I had to go through and not ultimately Mm. get it that she was like we have this you know like small part on this episode like you're gonna do it and I was like oh my god thank you like I was like I was very she must have really liked you I think but also like I think I like have a vibe of Italian from Jersey so you do the right I'm also Italian and my family immigrated into New York really where yeah we came in through like the Bronx Brooklyn yeah, my grandfather lived in Brooklyn. Where? In what part? I don't know. He died before I was born, so oh. I really only know a little bit about him. But okay. my, so all I have is my grandma being like seeing Cardi B on TV for the first time, and she went, 
Daisy, do you know that Cardi B? And I was like, yeah, Grandma, everyone knows Cardi B. Right. And she went, I just watched her on Late Night, and I heard her speak, and I went, that's a Bronx girl. <laughs> and she so was happy. so excited. I love it. But wait, it. so is your grandfather, the Italian side, is that Foco? Is that the... No, that's a made-up name. A lot of people don't know. Oh, no, I'm blowing DeAndrea it. is the Italian, like, last name, DeAndra. actually. And it's on my dad's side. It was okay. his mom, Deanna DeAndrea. Oh, my God. I like, know, it's aggressive. That would have been on the Sopranos. <laughs> Deanna DeAndrea. Deanna DeAndrea. Yeah. Grew up in an orphanage. Oh, my God. Yeah, I know. Even though she had a, both parents, but that's, like, a whole different story. But... Oh my God. Yeah. But she she came in like her dad and mom had immigrated from Italy and then they had her right after she got here. And then when she was like older, because she's not alive anymore, she went back to Italy and like visited all the spots that they were from in Venice. They're like very poor over there. But we didn't pass on any of the culture really. So now I'm trying to learn Italian to like bring it back. That's a great idea. I think it's good. It could be cool, right? I know I'm only really confident in like one sentence to be honest, which is Siamo americani mi dispiace che il mio italiano non sia molto buono. Which Hold is I'm, I, I'm American. Say it again. Siamo americani. Uh-huh. I'm I am American. Mi dispiace che Oh, I'm sorry. What? That that's it. That's mi it. Mi dispiace. Mi dispiace che il mio italiano I don't, I'm sorry, if, like if my Italian's not good. <laughs> yes. So wait. I'm an I, American, my Italian sucks. I'm so sorry. I used to teach for this program where um, uh, I taught in, uh, it was like a theater program that I taught with when I was like younger. And uh, we went to Italy and taught. And, and so I like learned a little bit of That's Italian. That's so cool. But we had translators because I'm like, I'm not going to be able to yeah, learn like, I can't do all these singing concepts. Right. But then um, we taught in Japan. And so I was like getting ready to go. So I'm like, I'm going to learn a little Japanese. And it took me like four weeks. And all I was able to learn like was one sentence was, Ego ga wakari wasu ka, nihango ga wakari masen. Which means, <laughs> do you know English? I speak no Japanese. <laughs> But apparently my pronunciation of it would be so good. It actually means, do you understand English? I don't understand Japanese. But my pronunciation was so good that people would just start like talking, slamming Japanese at me. And I'd be like, <laughs> 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 but like, I don't. But that all that like, sounds good, though. I believe that your pronunciation is on because like, I worked someone who so hard know. on that one sentence. Yeah, you body, though. <laughs> You're like, this is it. I need this. This is me. This is I'm going to rely on this. Because like, especially in I think when you go to a lot of European countries, mm -hmm. like it's polite that you start with, you know, but in a lot of European countries, there's some English where you can find mm -hmm. like, you know, I don't speak a ton of Italian, but yeah, I could, well, like, people will, like look at you and be like, "Are you American?" Right, and right. Then you're like, "Yeah, yes." Unfortunately, how did you? Fucking know but that? in Japan, no one speaks English, mm -hmm. and you're not even looking at character characters that are like similar. You know, where you're like, that you "Oh, can like kind of, I can see the Latin root." Yeah. So I would just have to be like, "So, like, please, please help me." I am yeah, not like, Japanese. I don't know where to go. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know how much this costs. I don't know what I'm eating. Like, it oh just my gosh. Was, <laughs> was it fun though? I've always was, wanted to go to Japan. It, it was so cool. Great. It was super great and. Um, the people were so great and it was such a, a special experience to like get to do that. Yeah. So I, I was always really glad I had that time, you know. Like, yeah, dude. Mm -hmm. What? That's awesome. So do you feel like, do you feel like you got typecast after The Sopranos because of being like tri-state New York kind you of know, Italian vibe? I don't. Um, I've done stuff like that. So I did another project recently called Somewhere in Queens with mm -hmm. Ray Romano and Sebastian Maniscalco and stuff. And that was like Italian family. And I have done that kind of person mm -hmm. a number of times because that is I think when you are on film especially or TV or film uh you tend to play somewhere close to who you are I think right. when I've done theater you can do something that's like more different than you yeah because like there's a 14 year old grandma on stage and stuff well yeah. right but like also the audience is like farther away so even mm -hmm. if it's not 14 year old grandma, but like you could do like, you know, you're doing like Oliver and you're like, mm -hmm. hello, I've got a British. And like, it doesn't have to, you know, it doesn't I mean, have to be so legit and people are still And you like, could have like yeah. people just kind of like buy into it because it's more of like a whole experience. But in TV, it's like kind of, it's like almost reading your mind, right? Yeah. Like film, because it's like so in your face. So that person is part of who I am. Like my family's from, like half my family's from Staten Island and Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And like, so that's my people. And so, like, even this Ray movie, which was Queens, I was like, I'm pulling from my my Brooklyn Italian yeah. roots, but it's the same kind of people. Yeah. And we all found that middle ground of, like, like Maniscalco is, um, excuse me, 
Chicago mm-hmm. Italian, but like there's similar values of being in a city and like, you know, like you just yeah. go, oh, sticking with your people. Yeah, your big family, you have your places. But your like areas. aside from that, I think a blessing and a curse that has been for me through my career is like, um, yeah, I don't think I've had like a type um, because A, I think the industry is kind of starting to move away from that because mm-hmm. like I think we have a lot of conversations about representation and what that means and like um, and how that's important to like have people who represent their communities. Yeah. But then I think you also run a risk of saying then people can only play that yeah, thing. People get boxed in. Which they are. Um, I think, but being like a plus size or like a thicker, a juicier lady, I think a lot of my career people tried to put me in that box. Mm-hmm. But I think inherently with that box comes the idea that you must have low self-esteem if you look like this or yeah. you must have low confidence Um, if that, if like you choose to make your body be like that and I never walk in a room and feel like that that way. Cause why the hell would you? But I think that that sort of was like, like has been a perception for larger people. And it's also like, I always think about that with character actors. Mm. I feel like there's something that happens like every few years or so, or every other career, there'll be like a character actor who usually does funny roles, self-deprecating roles. And then they'll do something really serious or like super creative. Yeah. And it gets rave reviews and people are like, oh my God, I had no idea that they they, could do it. They could do it. And they had that in them. And with character acting in particular, you're playing such like a a caricature every single time Mm. in different directions that like, of course, this is somebody who can act like this is a very specific style of acting that. That's such a good, I never thought of it that way. I think. I always thought of it like when you would like um, Steve Carell, who everyone always mm-hmm. knew to be like so funny, so funny. And then they were like, oh, that guy can act. Right. Yeah. Um, I think it's also when people have a really tremendous sense of humor. Mm-hmm. I think humor is a real understanding of humanity. And then like dramatic acting is also like essential, real, like humanity, right? So it's like, if you can make, like, what do all, most women say when you're like dating someone, you go, I just want someone who makes me laugh. Yeah, I want someone, a funny guy. Because also, like, because they, because that's a connection. When you laugh with somebody, it's like. You're in tune. We understand something together. We have a similar view or like, oh, that's so interesting that you see the world that way. It's like a, it's like a link. Yeah, Yeah. maybe in tune is a great way to put it. So um, I think that I always thought of it as, as humor, but you seeing a, a, as them like them approaching these big characters, of course they can approach more serious characters. I'm like, yeah, yeah sure, right? Because people think I think with like the jokey roles, people think it's it's easy because it's like not taken super seriously. But that's the reason why it's coming across so like effortless and silly is because they're doing exactly what they're being instructed to do. Yeah, or what they're just like naturally good at yeah. doing. You yeah. know what they I mean? They like know what the role is, mm. and they're they're delivering on that that's a, a great point that's really you know? interesting and so of course they can do that in other directions <laughs> you know and like i love whenever people are you do an actress different. too i went to acting school where did you go i went to uh wait where's in houston you? oh oh okay cool but i never like i never went anywhere with it i ended up like leaving school but like i still love like i love entertainment i love actors sure actors are such interesting dynamic people and you you have to tap into so much yeah, I think I've always, like, been very grateful that, like, in a way it – I don't want to say it's a form of therapy, but it can be therapeutic because you get to out live out or, like, imagine circumstances mm-hmm. in a safe way, right? Where yes. you're, like, some like, something traumatic, but then they say cut or, like, then the play ends and you bow and, like, you – I've learned from myself that when I have to do very heavy stuff – um, I did a series called New Amsterdam, which is like a Mm -hmm. really great hospital show that was on NBC. And I had this episode where my character was having a panic attack. There was like a a shooter in the hospital. And Mm -hmm. so my character was like in a closet and I was like, you know. Super real situation. Yeah. But yeah. And we had to film all my scenes were in like one day because we were in one location. So Mm -hmm. it was like nine hours of like varying stages of being on the panic attack. Right. And you had breaks, of course, because they'd go, you know, change the cameras. Got to take your five. But you're still like drumming that up. And 
um, like the next week, my body had these like random panic attacks because like, I think when you pretend something, your body doesn't know the difference between Mm -hmm. when it's like fake or when it's real. And I've learned now when I have to do something like that, really strenuous or extreme, I have to like as much as I can carve out like huge, like take a big salt bath that night Mm -hmm. and like the next day eat like really good and like, like keep the windows, like the shades drawn and light candles. Like I have to do so much like gentle, gentle sensory stuff, like maybe not even watch TV. You know what I mean? Yeah, just like be... Be so, un, understimulated, if anything. Way as much. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Way understimulated so that, and put as much good in my body, like water, greens. Yeah. So I'm just telling my body, like, that didn't happen. Yeah. Everything's okay. Or, like, if you're feeling residuals from that, it's it's the much faster way for me to process it than if I just try to, like, slam into the next yeah. thing. But sometimes you don't have that choice. You're going into something else. So... I'll just try to build in literal, even like on the drive home from set, I'll like put like something soothing on Mm -hmm. or like just focus on breathing for Mm -hmm. that 40 minute drive or whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, what's, what's interesting about that is there's, there's two things that I find super interesting. One, I went to this thing with, uh, the better internet initiative, like last year, they did this really cool event where they brought in all different types of creators and, and people from the UN alike. And they brought in this one musician who dealt with PTSD patients. Wow. And he would go in to hospitals during COVID and he would play music for just really short two minute intervals every hour for the staff. And they saw dramatic drops in the staff getting PTSD. Wow. Just from like two minutes. So when you take your five, if you listen to music, that can really help with your neural pathways so that you don't have these panic attacks. I also saw, I, by the way, I, I have had panic attacks, but I don't, it's, I don't always, but that's a specific experience of like, because I was drumming up Mm -hmm. like that specific physical behavior. Yeah. Then it like, my body was like, oh, we're having panic attacks. Yeah. But I read a study a couple years ago about, um, Alzheimer's patients. Mm Mm-hmm and dementia and how they lose the ability to like connect and speak. And this woman was going in and realizing because they withdraw, people withdraw from them. So they weren't getting physical touch or people weren't talking to them. So she would sing them songs from their childhood and like touch them. And as she was doing this, I was like watching like um, recordings of this study. You could see the patients like slowly like coming to and then trying to like Sing right. with her people who had been nonverbal for years. So music, 100%. Yeah, music is really, it, it locks Taps in. into something. And with like, I, I think it's so interesting what you're talking about with like your body not knowing the difference between it being real and fake. Because I've never really thought about that. Because I never, I never had to play any super heavy roles like that. I didn't get typecast in, or I did get typecast as like sort of like flirty, fun, like <laughs> girl yeah, for everything. And I girl. was like, what the hell? Let me be dark. <laughs> but uh I, that makes sense though. Cause like your vagus nerve in your stomach, you know, when you, you know, when someone really like hurts you, you feel it. And phys- yeah. And you feel the waves all over your body of like that, like searching through your, your pores almost. Well, think about like anytime anyone talks about what happened, like, uh, oh, I had a gut feeling about that. Yeah. Yeah. Or like I have butterflies in my stomach. It's your second brain. It, yeah. Or like, just like, um, I feel lightheaded or mm-hmm. like your body, all of the expressions we have are relating to our body like physically responding yeah. to our emotional lives. Yeah, your emotional state. And like when you feel that like wave across your skin, I just learned like that's your nervous system looking for the injury. So like when someone- oh my, Like a body you, scan. Yeah, it's a body scan. It's a literal body scan. So when someone hurts you really, really bad and you feel that, you know that you're so upset that your body thinks you must have been mortally wounded. Holy can I say shit? Yes, Holy you can. shit. That's amazing. Isn't that crazy? So like, I've, of course it does. Of course. Yeah. And so like when you're faking and your body doesn't know the difference, it's of course taking it seriously because yeah. you're still in that state of like yes. breathing heavy, being upset. Cause like, that's the only way to, to get there for your role. Some actors don't have to do that. Like the, the, the I've worked with actors who are like, they just, Oh, are you ready? And they, and it's as real as anything. I, think as I get older and like, I know myself more, I don't have to always like Work kill up. myself with preparation. Cause sometimes once I can get it going, then like it, I don't have to like keep. Yeah. Keep holding drum, it. Right. Drumming it up. Right. But some actors can just cut. Yeah. That was good. Oh, you want to do it one more time? All right. Hold on. That's so okay. Amazing. And like some people are just really there with it and it can be very real. And some people 
just tackle it very technically. Mm -hmm. Um, And that, I I think it's also a matter of what works for each person, of Mm -hmm. course, right? What any person's like process is. But then also ultimately what's it about? It's really, what's the audience buying? Like does, if I am like making myself like, so upset and crying my eyes out that might make you cr- upset which is the point but if someone else goes all right hold on just put some vaseline under my put some menthol yeah and they the start edge. acting it there and the audience feels the same thing what's the is is the difference that if they can get there that way and i can get there this way like it's yeah. really about you guys or whoever's watching yeah, it, how right? it reads yeah that's yeah. really what it's for. what do you what do you think about because people have such mixed opinions on this method acting um, I, I trained in method. Like mm-hmm. that's my Meisner was where I like come from. Mm-hmm. Um, I, th- again, I really think anyone's process is what works for anyone. But I also think like, you know, the, um, the legal expression, like the right to swing your hand stops at my nose. Yeah. Like, you can swing your arms, but if you break my nose, then you've assaulted me. Right. Yes. So if you are a method actor, that's fine. But if someone else next to you is not playing the same game as you, like you're not entitled mm-hmm. to like force to them like- into your game. But uh, so the movie we did, the movie I did with Ray, um, he was uh, also directing it. It was his directorial debut and he wrote it. So he's like wearing a lot of hats. Mm-hmm. But there was one day we were doing, you know, this big scene where he was like drunk and it was like very emotional and he had to be, but like very drunk at the top of the scene. So in between takes, he was like going in a corner and like listening to music, we would do like five or six takes before mm-hmm. he'd like check. But so he could stay in the acting zone. And then he'd come sit at the table and he would just start like he was feeling drunk, like in his way and talking to people in their character names and like playing with people. And so I realized I'm like, oh, he's being method. Like he's like, this is my way into this scene. Mm-hmm. So I was like, I'll play this game. Like uh, so I started playing with him, too. And then he was like. I was like, I get it. I get where you are. And Mm -hmm. like, I'm totally, I'm willing to do that because it was not him going, everyone has to do this. Yeah. But I went, oh, it's him offering like an invitation. Or if if I can jump in that pool with you and it's not interfering with me, then I'm happy to like, because really that scene wasn't about me. My character had like two reactions. So it's really about him Mm -hmm. getting there. So I'm like, if I can help you, like. Yeah, why not? A hundred percent. But if it, but if my helping you interferes with me doing my job, then I have to go, all right, hold, let me, then right. let me stay out of your way. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. You're like referring to like the sort of method actor horror stories that we hear sometimes of people. I haven't had any, I've never been on a set with anyone who's like that. And I would be interested, like, um, I mean, I don't know if you saw Jim and Andy, that Andy, that, um, Jim Carrey doc. I like, I would be very interested to see like how I felt, but I think it would also depend on who my character was in mm-hmm. the film. But like Power of the Dog, Benedict Cumberbatch Mm -hmm. wouldn't sit with anyone. So like when everyone would go between takes fives, he made them put his chair like in a whole other place because he's like, I'm an outsider, you know. I um, feel like that that's like such like a harmless way to method act too. But I think they're all okay. But if he's not playing Andy Kaufman, like I wonder if Benedict Cumberbatch was playing Andy Kaufman, maybe he would have been like a prankster or yeah. And and Jim Carrey got incredible results in that film mm-hmm. like yeah, it's like did. spooky out of body like you know Kaufman's family went to visit him and said it was like they're like whoa going to a seance yeah like yeah. so I don't know I I don't know where it I don't depends. know people are making art right yeah it's whatever I, I that's such a good point that people are making art because I feel like method acting people really only complain about when they don't like the end result like when they they feel oh. like the art is bad that's I I want to say that's fair. Like I have to think that through. Like, but the more I think, I'm thinking about it right now. I'm I'm cycling through like all the method actors I'm I'm thinking of. I never hear bad things about, and the except the ones that I I am thinking of right now, which is just one or two. It's specific projects that weren't well received. Wow. And you mean like you think the method actor was un- unhappy with their performance, or you think other people were unhappy with the method? Like I think that. If the movie had gotten rave reviews, people would have decided that they didn't mind it too much retrospectively. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I and then it's like, well, how how can we ever know what the yeah, other you result? Yeah, never would be? really know. But I think that's a really interesting observation. I have to think about. It's that. like a Schrodinger's or Schrodinger's hat. <laughs> Could be right. Yeah, yeah. We'll never can't open. We'll the never box. know. Yeah. If the movie was well received, would people still think still he's a dick? 
you know? Maybe I mean, not. Daniel Day Lewis is famously method, and on link on when he did Lincoln, he mm-hmm. made everybody call him Mr. President, and Which, like um, that's endearing to me. Well, I know people. I know two people actually who were on that film, and I won't say who, but one of them was saying that um, like at lunch when they would have like the cast lunch breaks, he would be like. Martin Van Buren is such a muckraker. And they'd all have like, uh-huh. like he would they'd be, be like, oh, even telling sir. jokes of like the time. Like, sir, please yeah. beseech you. That's Which crazy. is like pretty wacky, but you're like, but again, he's bringing something that's like pretty that's astonishing. Fun. Yeah, but, yeah, that's, but that's it, right? So you're like, if I can get in that pool, I'll play that game. If yeah. I can't play that game, I'll go sit at the other lunch table. I'll then. be like, sir, your charisma's off the sir, your charisma. This is why you got the polls. <laughs> Sir, four and twenty. Oh wait, oh God, four and four score and four twenty score years and ago. Four score and twenty years ago, you, you made me laugh. <laughs> you made me laugh. <laughs> but no, it's true though. Like the only times like people complain about it is they're like, and the movie wasn't even good, so it was all for what? Interesting. You know, interesting. Whereas other times, there's a couple of people who have talked about harrowing experiences, and they're like, but the film needed that, and so I feel like it. It does kind of depend on if the movie's good. Yeah. 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 What if, for you, what's your like dream role? Like if you could pick any, like you don't have to worry about the rights, you don't have to worry about who's in it. Like you could just be like, and that's me. You know, I think when you talk about like theater, mm-hmm. then you think about dream roles. Cause in theater, people, people, they do new plays, but they do stuff over. And film and TV, of course, there are remakes, but like it's always a remake, but different. Mm-hmm. So, I don't know that I have dream roles anymore. I think now when I say like I'm writing stuff, like you were saying before when you were in school, you would get typecast as like the fun times flirty girl and you wanted to do dark stuff. And when I would teach, I always say to students now, I'm like, you can't be an actor anymore. Like you have to be like a writer. You have to make your own stuff. You do TikToks. You like have a podcast. Like you can't just be like, I do one thing. That's true. So I would have said to you if you were like, I'm an actor or you or you continue to pursue it, write the dark thing that's you, right? So true. So, okay. So so now I say- If you're going to write the dark thing, like what would you write for yourself? Like what kind of character? I feel like I have, so I'm, I'm writing a couple of projects right now with some people mm-hmm. and um, one of them is more like geared towards me and one of them is more geared towards another person I'm writing with. And so- I guess what I'm trying to say is um, I have been fortunate that like by not specifically saying I want to do X Mm -hmm. and like just kind of letting the universe guide me towards something like uh, physical, which Mm -hmm. I know we were going to talk about in a minute um, on Apple TV that I did prior to that, I had said to my reps, um, I didn't want to do any more things where the character was described as like fat or overweight because I didn't book it. And often it just was like the point of it was because they, you know. Yeah, like you're the punchline. The punchline. Yeah. And I was like, I'm not doing it. And they were like, no problem. And so the pandemic rolls around and physical comes and the character's like overweight. And I was like, I don't know if I want to do this. And my manager, who I've been with such a long time, um, who I love more than anything, uh, is said to me, this is really good people. Mm -hmm. And um, let's try it. When you get to the stage of like the test, we'll say to them, we need more info. We have to understand why this is. But he's like, I just think these people do good projects. And like, I've never seen them do something where a woman is the butt of a joke or the fact. Yeah, where it feels exploitative. Right. Yeah. So I was like, okay. So I do it. And I'm like, it is good scenes. It's really good. So I do the material. You know, it like moves through, moves to the next stage. So then they give us more info and let me read some scripts and stuff. And then I realize with context, um, that the reason Greta was overweight was because Sheila was so thin Mm -hmm. and that the whole point was like, it did not matter what body either of these women were in. They both were struggling with like loving themselves. They had the same issue that they were both, they were foils for each other. And when Greta became empowered, like Sheila was kind of like, Oh my, like it kind of was like, um, not eye opening, but maybe like almost shocking, not shocking. I don't know how to say it. That it was like, um, wow, look at this woman who's like loving herself and like exploring her sexuality and like- It was revolutionary to her. Right. And Greta was looking at Sheila like all of season one, like you are everything that a woman should want to be. Like, why aren't you happy? Why are you still upset? So I think that 
then all of a sudden it became really empowering yeah. that I looked the way I looked. And every time it was like addressed or in any way on the show, mm-hmm. it was either in an empowering way or it was like, I don't feel great about myself, but for a Yeah, it was necessary. Good it had a purpose that wasn't like just I was oh. never the butt of any joke. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was like actually relevant to like. And still getting and to plot. be like very funny, but yeah. never like ha ha ha. Yeah. You know? And you know what? You just, we don't have a lot of that in media right now. Really, the only other example I can think of, and it's animated, is Bojack Horseman. They oh have a God. character who's like depressed. Yeah. And when she finally gets a foothold on her depression, she gains weight. And she's happy. Finally happy. And she's finally happy with herself. Yep. And it's that's the only time I've ever seen, like usually you see it inverted where they they make it, this person's so sad, that's why they're overweight. And then they get thin and their problems are solved. And then this show depicted like, this character was underweight from nervousness and stress and not taking care of themselves. That's so interesting. And then like once they finally like got medication that they liked and a therapist that they liked, now they're like at their natural stasis that they should be at and look how great it is. I think it's it's hard now too, right? Because it's like um we were on we had this very body positive movement. Mm-hmm. I think there still is some, but I think there's this like uh prevalence now of also weight loss drugs, which I know also have like Like Ozempic? Yes, which have huge medical benefits, which like Mm -hmm. 100% I applaud, right? I really do. Um, But I'm also like what I think is so hard about that is like we're already so many young women, especially men too, I think, but look at social media and see these really idealized people. And what we're not realizing is Someone has taken 800 selfies of themselves and then thrown it through, you know, four AI generators. And now also they can afford to take like $900 shots. Mm -hmm. So like, but some 14 year old girl is sitting at home going, oh my God. Like, Like why am I not motivated enough to be that person? Yeah. Just eat well. Why don't I have enough discipline to be them? They said that they just drink green tea every morning and and then do Pilates and they look like that. And I'm doing that and I'm not getting the same results. I'm, I'm doing something wrong. But I feel like also, I feel like I hear way less about body positivity now. Absolutely. Like love yourself for whatever you look like. I, and I I think that does still exist, but I feel like there was such a there's been a pullback. Oh yes, there's definitely right? been a notable. Pullback. I feel like you're you you are more clicked into like social media milieu than yeah. I am, but like it, I can feel that. No, there's there has been one. I normally I'm a talking head on TikTok, and like a month ago was I rarely do like a full body shot just because mm-hmm. it doesn't make sense for my contact mm-hmm. content. But I did a meme on like my spam account, like where I barely have any followers on there. And it was a joke about like me cleaning the whole house. I have like very, have OCD tendencies about like organizing everything. Okay. And then, you know, when you clean things and then someone puts like a spoon in the sink and then you're like, oh my God. Like I was making a joke about that, which I had put the spoon in the sink. Like I made myself like one. (laughs) And then there was that audio that's like, oh, that work and what did it get? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So I'm just standing there in front of the sink doing this and that video across like Instagram and TikTok, it got more than than 12 million views. And all of the comments were people talking about my body, which has oh, never be- happened before. Oh my God. Because I, I never really show my body, which isn't by design, but I didn't even like think that that would matter. But so as a content creator, because I know you guys must be driven. I have a number of friends who are content mm-hmm. creators. You're driven on some level by the numbers and by, yeah. right? So now you know that that helps drive your viewership. Yeah, but, but I haven't done it. But how I does that make it. you feel? Yeah, because you go, it. Ugh, it's like I'm using my body or something, yeah. right? I didn't like it because I'm really known online for my brain. and Which is awesome. Thank you. I like that about my content. And what people were talking about, it, what, it, it wouldn't have bothered me if people were just being nice and being like, oh, you look cute. What bothered me is that people were being so mean to each other in the comments. What do you mean? Because half of the people were like, oh my God, you look great. 
And then the other half of, of people were like, this is a body check, which is something with people with EDs do online sometimes. And I had to learn about that whole process. I didn't know anything about so that. So wait, people were calling you out saying, mm-hmm. do you have, you're so, you look thin to us. I'm assuming. Yeah, they that? were, they were saying that I was standing in like a fake way to make myself look a specific way. Oh my god. But my goodness. spine is fused, so I can only stand one way. Oh so my gosh, you poor thing. That was my response where I was like, I get literally, this is the only stance I have, but they were arguing with each other and it, it was getting so aggressive because obviously like it's a point of real insecurity for sure. most people is like weight. So they were getting so riled up with each other and it was causing like such like just viciousness yeah. that it made me like really viscerally uncomfortable. And like as a content creator, you know, the algorithm can't tell the difference between good and bad comments. It's just So if I want to keep going viral, I can keep standing like that in front of the camera. But to me, it wasn't worth it because of how unpleasant people were with each other. Oh my goodness. I feel like uh, it's it just interesting when you talk about that and how triggering it was for people because I think that is a huge, it's been a big positive and negative about physical because of, mm-hmm. um, you know, because it does deal with EDs and uh, also at a time when America did not know what those were. So yeah. What I love about our show um, is that is like not is like almost the bluntness of it because because there is no language for it. We're not mm-hmm. dancing around. We're not using like politically correct terminology. terms. Yeah, because we're like she, uh, Sheila and I, uh, Rose Byrne uh, and I have like this big fight in season two at one point where she finally goes, "Guess what? I'm bulimic," mm-hmm. and um, my character's like, "So you're cheating?" Because like, right? We I. Greta doesn't know what it is. Yeah. And it's like so – when I read the scene, I remember when we got that script, Rose texted me that night and she was like, mate, oh my God, we're going to fight. And I was like, oh my God, it's so cruel. Yeah. But my character has been so pushed around, pulled back and forth by her that I'm like – I don't even – when she tells me that, yeah. I don't know what that means. Does that mean now like – you know, yeah. anyway, it, it, it's such like a a realistic response. I feel uh, for somebody who like wouldn't know the terminology yeah. in the time and yes. feels like baited by this person. Yes, to be like, oh, like, well, she was cutting corners, you know, and like not yeah. to understand it all because you don't understand. You know what? A very incredibly sad. We have you're gonna have to put a trigger warning on this um, episode, but a very sad um, fact is when Gilda Radner had a had a terrible eating disorder was mm-hmm. very famous on SNL. Um, a very, very terrible eating disorder, bulimia. And, um, but they didn't know it was an eating disorder. And so there are not whole articles, but there are Mm -hmm. pieces of interviews with her where they talk about how she found this new great way to lose weight where you can eat what you want. You can eat whatever you want. But that was the same time leading up to when we, like the time period we're talking Mm -hmm. about. So people were thinking about it. Like you look at, ballerinas would smoke instead of like cigarettes yeah, are a great way to suppress appetite, appetite. Suppressant. and you I'm sure you've seen those things floating online of you know the intermediate fasting diet of the, or no the women's diet in the 70s where it was like oh, a yeah. glass of wine and a boiled egg for breakfast yeah. and like the military diet yeah but like that was a this, big one yeah this was like 300 calories or less every day for three days a week so it was like a real thing at that time that mm-hmm. my character would have looked at her and gone so this is what you're doing that you're not, you're not yeah. losing weight because you're exercising. I thought you just looked like that and you were doing things better than me. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, it's really sad. And then mm-hmm. it's a lovely way they sort of come around together and then they learn support each other. Right. But, um, yeah, yeah. it's like, anyway, that brings really- up a good point of media literacy though. Cause that's something a lot of uh, Gen Z has been talking about. Media literacy is becoming a real problem with new shows and, and movies and stuff because, we have you save an education crisis. Um, kids are watching shows and they would see a moment like that and they would of they course. would be like, Horrified. she's a terrible person. Right. But you can't have a character arc if your character doesn't learn anything. Uh, it's so funny when you say that. So I, I do, I've done a lot of teaching. Um, I love teaching. Mm-hmm. And um, one of the things I've talked a lot about uh, with students, especially in this culture where it's like um, – Nobody wants to be cruel to each other, which I think is wonderful, right? Mm-hmm. Culturally. There's huge positives to that. Pendulum swing moment, though. But if we want to tell stories, if I want to tell a story where I am supporting a marginalized person, it is 
Not my story. It is their story. Mm -hmm. In that story, that person needs to overcome something, which Mm -hmm. means somebody has to be the bad guy. Someone has to suck. At least for a second. Yeah. But yeah, but like this is the whole, right? Like if if they don't, if the whole film or the whole play or the whole whatever scene Mm -hmm. is just two people being like, how are you? I honor and respect your feelings. And I'm great. And And we saved the world with next to no friction. Right. So that's the thing. But like good guys have to overcome bad guys. bad guys. And bad guys can be complex and layered and like have a a valid point of view but yeah, still be doing motivation. a bad thing. So that to me, but that to me is interesting storytelling and then I'm like that's what creates empathy yeah. and the ability to go, "Oh my gosh, I didn't know." That's what you went through when yeah. you were young. And now I have now a I better understand. of you as a person. Yeah, I understand how you got there, even though I might not agree with it. I see where you ended up but and I'm, like how you started. I think it's so cool. I really do that you're like opening my eyes to that that conversation is happening because things do require context. Like we're only where we're at mm-hmm. because we weren't there. We yeah, weren't we there. weren't always there. Right. And that's what that's how we're progressing. And that's why I say it's like a pendulum swing moment because mm-hmm. like it's so awesome that we're overcorrecting. I just hope that we don't go too far backwards because there's you always swing until you, you meet a stasis in the middle. So we're going to go back a little bit at some point. I just hope it's not super intense you know i mean it's it's up to this next generation to like keep going you know that every time right paula abdul said two steps forward two steps two back steps but back. it's like you know it's like anytime you move forward a little and then you step back mm-hmm. and then you move forward the progress is made in that way yeah. progress doesn't just march forward because then you end up off a cliff like then you don't yeah. know you're in totally uncharted territory well, and then like what are you even fighting if it's so easily overcome you know there you go that's what are you true. Even fighting? It's it's obviously not a problem if all you have to do is just be like, "Hey, stop!" and people go, "Okay, <laughs> you know, okay. <laughs> cool." Like, I had no idea. That's right. That's right. You know, and that that I don't know. Star Wars. I don't want to enrage the fandom, but <laughs> people were very upset with the newer Star Wars movies yeah. because they were calling Ray's character a Mary Sue, and a Mary Sue is when like there's no training arc. Like they just are born awesome and they stay awesome the whole time. But wait, why is world. that Mary Sue? I don't actually know the root of the name. Copy. Okay. But I do know that that's like what it means. Because I it. saw everyone saying it and I was like, what the hell is that? What is a Mary yeah, Sue? Yeah. And I looked Thank it up. Thank God, because like I know I'm like of another generation, but I'm always like. Yeah, I didn't know either. Okay. So great. don't worry. But Thank like, you. yeah, people were mad because they were like, so Ray was just like living in the desert and is powerful and we get no context to why she's so awesome. And that's why like the reviews were all bad and like the live action Mulan they instead of having her go through like the awesome let's get down to this <laughs> they just had her born with like chi like she they made her a superhero and so there was no development she was just awesome the whole time and then saved the world and so we keep seeing that because people don't want like the unpleasant chapters where like people are struggling or bad things are happening well isn't that interesting because it sounds like to me what you're saying is the same people are who are saying, boo, she's had no struggle, are the people that they're doing that for who yes. are like, boo, people boo, shouldn't be mean struggle. to other people. We shouldn't have to watch her struggle. Exactly. And so I, said, I used to say all this. It doesn't make sense. It's, but I think I said, I, I mean, I hate to use all my teacher isms, but I would say to students all the time, when caterpillars are going to become butterflies and they build the cocoon, they literally, their entire bodies liquefy yeah. inside and then they rebuild. And I'm like, do you think that is a pleasant feeling? <laughs> like it yeah. can't be. It's but in be order terrible. to become, like to evolve into the next thing, the stronger thing, the more beautiful, whatever it is that you're moving towards, sometimes it is like discomfort. Yeah. Like it's like dating a terrible person and your whole body does a body check. Well, if you don't date a couple of terrible people, you won't know when you meet the well, awesome, awesome person or whatever no it is. no context. You have no idea how awesome they are. You have a couple of terrible jobs with awful bosses that you go, I hate doing this. When then when you find the job that's amazing that you love. You're so grateful. And it still might not be perfect, but you're going to have a context for, well, I know what yeah. shitty was. There <laughs> so is no light is without like, the dark. It's totally true. Yeah. It's totally true. It is true. It, like I always, um, anytime my friends get like demoralized, I, I tell them they're in their stump phase of life. What does that mean? Because when I was like, I made it up, but like it's, <laughs> when I was like eight, there was like a cherry tree in my yard that I like loved because I thought it was like awesome. And I used to go look at it every morning. And one day I went out there and it was cut down. It was just a stump. <gasps> And I was like devastated I because I was like a 
big like Fern Gully girl. So I was like, who killed the tree? Like, oh my God, this is literally my nightmare. And my dad was like, oh, there were beetles like eating the roots of this tree. We had to cut it down before it infected all of the other trees. Right. And I was like eight. So I was like, I don't care. Like, you I know, I was like, upset. my tree. Yeah. And he was explaining to me, like, you know, darling, we live in Texas. There's not a lot of soil here. It's just bedrock. So what that means now that we we have this tree that was growing here, once we rip this up and we plant something else, it's gonna be so much more beautiful because it already has the space to grow. It's already carved out the rock. <gasps> Oh my, oh my God, I might cry. And then we planted this beautiful tree there that's now this massive like purple wisteria tree, which is now my new favorite type of tree. And so it ultimately, he was correct. There is a stump phase where it's ugly and you don't like it and you feel the death of the thing that you once loved only to find something more beautiful. But it carved out the space for the, (gasps) oh my God, Daisy, I really am very moved by this. I think it's a really good analogy. Yes, it carved out the space for, I'm really a move. It carved out the space for something else to grow. Yeah. But that's, but think about talking about adversity. Yeah, that's life. For this little tree to have to, Carve to through carve rock. rock only to get eaten by beetles, but to make the space for another tree. But it made the tree. space for another tree to oh, not have to beautiful. worry about it. That's really special. Yeah. And so, like, anytime anything bad is happening to me, I just think I'm just in a stump phase of this situation. Oh, I li- I'm going to use that. You should. I really think, like, I'm going to be like, my friend Daisy told me this story yes. about this. And you're going to be a beautiful wisteria tree you're at the be end. A beautiful of it wisteria all. tree. It's going to be incredible. Wow. And you were still a beautiful cherry tree before. Yeah. You know, there's no ugly part. It's just a stump. It's okay. It's that's life. That's life. And you go through the stump phase a million times. Yeah. It just keeps happening. Yeah. Over and over and over. But think about that for it also to like take that analogy one step further. Every time you do, it's more and more space, more space, bigger roots, better tree. Right. More beautiful. So, and more Easier. stronger tree who's mm-hmm. like, oh, I'm learning from this environment. Well, now I'll, you know, that's evolution. I'll build yeah. a protectant against these beetles all, yeah. you know. And then you're this giant, gorgeous redwood by the end. Yeah, you are. Yeah. 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 Heck yeah. What What is your redwood? What do you want to be? I think I am what I want to be. You are what you want to be. That's I, amazing. I, when I was a little kid, um, I always wanted to be an actor. My grandfather was, oh, you've left me like very emotional right now. Good. My grandfather was um, in community theater. He was an amazing tap dancer and he um, was like a really wonderful actor. I used to go see him do shows. And so uh, I just would like, he, we'd, he'd come off stage and I would like, he'd say a line of dialogue and I could like say the next line. Like I always wanted to do this. My family would do like little plays for my family and like always sing and all this mm-hmm. stuff. So I think I took it for granted that I got to be what I want when yeah. I grow up. You and it was dream early and you executed. And I think I th- always thought everyone did and then people mm-hmm. just didn't do it. And I know a lot of people who are like, no, I didn't know what I wanted to be yeah. when I was a kid. But I wasn't it, always an actor, right? I've had yeah. plenty of years of not. Like um, things for me really took off, I would say, like 10 or so years ago. Um, but I was always just like going at it mm-hmm. and uh, – I think I also was fortunate because I loved teaching. So when I wasn't acting and I was getting to do something else I really loved. You were still fulfilled. I was, yeah, like I'm still in that sort of um, creative space, like that positive space, Mm -hmm. which I think when you stay in the good space, it brings good things to you when you can. Yeah. So, yeah, I I think that's my answer. I'm really, I'm very lucky. Yeah, you are lucky. But I work really hard. Yes. Well, it's a combination of those two things, Mm -hmm. you know, luck and hard work. Do you... If you could go back in time, like, what would you tell yourself? Would you tell yourself anything? My young self? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. What, what age? Pick any, any age. You can pick. You can do, like, three if you want. I don't care. Okay. Uh, well, I think young actor Deirdre, when I would be, like, seeing friends of mine getting roles and me mm-hmm. being, like, am I, do I suck or, like, am I not, am I not going to ever do it? I'm going to be able to tell her. You're going to do it. It's just not going to look the way you thought it was. Like, it's not going to happen tomorrow. It's just going to, you know, it's going to happen when the time is right for you. And uh, then I think it's so funny. I have two nieces now, one who's nine and one who's five. And so, like, watching them go through things with friends or Mm -hmm. like the five-year-old told me that a girl in her class told her one day in gymnastics that her belly looked fat in her gymnastics but I was like she's fat like you're five your organs gotta go somewhere you know how like your bodies go like this and this and this so she's still not like not quite has her baby belly but like you know I'm talking about 
But she's so, my God, this she kid's so athletic. Five. And I like hate. I was like so, I went, is she <laughs> five and someone's commenting on your body? Yeah. Which then made me think, what is that little kid's I know. parents What's saying to What's going on with her? Exactly. But it's like, there's so many things I would say to myself. But the, like when I see them going through things or my nine-year-old niece, if she is having a struggle with friends mm -hmm. or something, like I'm like, it's, that's almost the times when I feel like I'm almost able to be talking to myself at that age yeah. where I'm like, oh, I know this sucks now, but I promise you in two weeks, you will not remember yeah. it. But right now it feels like the it's worst terrible. thing in the world. It is maybe the worst thing in your world you've ever seen so yeah. far. Yeah. You know? I always think about with like babies crying. This is like such a random tangent, but I always think that like, you know how parents are like sometimes like this baby's crying and I don't know why I fed him. I birthed him. I did everything. I think sometimes it's just the existential dread of it all. Like, yeah. You, you know? think babies have existential I do, dread. <laughs> just because like, I don't think they know that's what it is, but like, I think they do. Cause like, imagine like you're just in another state that you've never been in before all of a sudden. And it's so overstimulating. You would be like, what the hell? And what you can do is yell. I think it's, I mean, I don't want to, I think that's actually hilarious what you just said. It's true. But I don't think it's existential dread as much as like, you learn everything by comparison. So for a baby, mm -hmm. if you're like, right now I'm like, oh, I feel the air. My knee is chilly. Yeah. But like, if you're a baby and you're a little chilly for the first time, you're like, Devastating. what is this? Yeah. But until you go, oh, I've been oh, chilly fine. and I've survived. Yeah, but you're like, this is A, the most painful thing I've ever experienced. Yes. This chill. B, this hunger. it's so scary. Right. Because like, what is it? What is it? What is it? Am I going to die? What's dying? I don't even know. I just have a feeling that something bad is happening. I have to happening. keep myself alive. And the only way I know to keep myself alive is to scream for yeah. the person who keeps me alive. It's the one thing I can do. And like, so sometimes it's like, maybe they're like, Maybe just like their their leg, it just feels slightly weird and they're 100%. freaking out, you know? Yeah. Could be anything. Yes. But I don't know that the existential dread, but I think it, <laughs> it might be an awareness of like. <laughs> I think it's, yeah, like, I mean, in the Mortality. loose system terms, okay. just like everything is like, <laughs> you're like, what the hell? Yes, no, no, that's legit. I get what you're saying. <laughs> it just was such, a, I'm like imagining a baby with existential is dread life? is really funny. What is my purpose? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Like I'm not sure there's 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 at that level, but but that's a good concept. You pitch that to Netflix. A philosophical baby. And with existential dread. Honestly, very, <laughs> very adult swim coded. hundred percent. It. It's very like boss baby or like there was a movie from the eighties called like Look Who's Talking, where like the babies could talk but the adults couldn't hear them. It's oh, like, that's interesting. It was it was like um like a stupid humory movie where mm -hmm. like, you know. The babies would be like, yeah, did she give you milk today? And like, you know, like they'd all have like grown <laughs> she up. She gave me a like, bottle. Exactly. Yeah. And so that was like the humor of the film. But yeah, you could, you could like, uh, I don't know. That's a, that's a decent pitch. We should, we should, we should, it we'll, we'll refine it. We'll figure it out, you know, <laughs> before we bring it anywhere. Philosophical babble. Yeah. Maybe something like that. What, it, like writing wise, do you feel like you have a preferred genre that you want to get into or, or do I you think feel like that's a box? Uh, I, th I mean, anything's a box. I also think now uh, things are so much more genre less. Like mm -hmm. Jerry Seinfeld just put out that Unfrosted movie. And that's like the first thing I can think of in a long time that was like, this is a comedy. Like, yeah. Seinfeld is very clear about how he's like, I just want to make things that make people laugh. Mm -hmm. Right. And certainly there have been like comedies that are out or dramas. But I think m more now we see these things that are like like stand-up comedians doing like very serious projects. Yeah, like or, Inside was right. funny but sad. Right. Yeah. So I think I am interested in comedy. I like doing comedy, but I think I have a natural bent towards, I'm just interested in telling real stories, like things mm -hmm. that feel real to me or like interesting. But yeah, I'm like still very new at the writing thing. Well, you're so. a writer. It doesn't matter how new you are. Well, I mean like, so. Once you're writing, I would say. You're a writer. It's true. You know? I think that's fair to some degree, but I also think, I don't know that I've done enough of anything yet to be like, this is a genre I like. I do oh, know that, that I like comedy. I like being funny. And I, I also feel like, um, maybe that's goal oriented. So I know if I'm like, okay, how do, how do I make this funny? Or yeah. this is funny. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Like, yeah, that's you're more, experimenting and you're like, this is where I feel myself going. I think right so. Now. I think so. I like, I like the cultural shift towards like, being a little more genre less, like I feel like the first like really major project that like sort of just sort of like lived in that space is like Orange is the New Black. Yep. Because it was considered a comedy at first and it became 
very serious, very important project. Yep. You know, but like it made sense that it would evolve from comedic to serious because the character is not taking it that serious at first. She doesn't think it's that big of a deal. I think that also started with streaming because I think when um, stuff was, when all you had was network programming, half hours were for comedy and Mm -hmm. one hours were for dramas. And so like there was also just like very clear boxes things were Mm -hmm. in. So when something is streaming, they still kind of have those rules or like those guidelines but an episode can be 42 minutes or an hour 15 or like it opens you up to much more many more possibilities yeah which life is like right in this same conversation we've had like we've talked about existential babies and we've talked about like eating disorder like we've gone like this huge gamut of that's life yeah it is and like that's that's why it feels like more real I know that like some people I've heard like a sort of feeling of like complaint in the comedy space that like they want to go see a rom-com and have it just be light But even with, like, the really classic rom-coms, it's never just been light. Mm. Like, maybe it doesn't have as heavy beats as we have in some of them now because they're tackling issues that are closer to people's hearts and there's less fear to cover these really important topics, Mm. I think. Um, But, like, if still, if you watch, like, old rom-coms, like, there's devastation, there's betrayal, there's sadness. There has to be. Otherwise, there's no payoff if they get together at the end. Exactly. Like, we're not invested. Like, Moulin Rouge. That movie ain't new. That movie's devastating. That movie is really sad. It's so good, though. So good. So incredible, but so, so sad. I had a friend who would sleep over, and we would watch it, like, once a month, and my <laughs> dad always knew she was at my house, because, like, you know, dads are, are like, oh, your friend, uh, what what the hell is in the house? <laughs> your friend moved you know? on Rouge, yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> and he would be, like, upstairs typing, headphones on, and then he would just hear, like, at the intro music, there was a boy. <laughs> You'd already be crying. And, yeah. And he was like, oh, my God, lions downstairs. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I have a deadline. I can't do this. That's so funny. But I loved it. I would watch it anyway. Is there anything we have to wrap up? Thank you so much for coming on. You've been so good. Oh my Is gosh, there anything so you need to plug? Uh, uh, I there, I can't plug anything right now. There's a couple things in the works, but I can't talk about I wish Guys, I would. watch her. I wish we had done this a month from now. Let's just say Valid. that Well, way. we can do it again, you know? We can do it anytime you want. You can always come back. I can't plug it now. So, but thank you. It's been really fun. Dude, I, they're physical awesome. on Apple TV. Um, New Amsterdam is on Netflix. Somewhere mm-hmm. in Queens is on a bunch of platforms. There's other stuff I've done, but those are like those recent are the ones, ones that, are that have been floating around lately. Okay, guys, keep an eye on her for her upcoming projects and also for our existential dread <laughs> For our existential three years from now. <laughs> Cartoon Network. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. I ain't never seen you, that's something I